with that, let's go ahead and talk about fornication. Fornication. So fornication is defined. Um, um, it's it's found in the Hebrew zana, um, and pronounced zana. Uh, Hebrews twenty one twenty eight, and the Strong's. It's only used four times in the Old Testament, and is defined as a form of adultery, falling under the seventh commandment, usually involving a female in whoredom like prostitution. So usually a woman that um, is unmarried um, and is committing acts of sexual. Uh, for for money, uh, acts uh, of sexual gratification for money. It can be also used figuratively as idolatry in the Hebrew language. In Greek, it is the word pornea, where we get the word pornography from in English, and uh, it's found in the Greek in 4204 and 4203. The word pornea is defined as harlotry. So to look at pornography is a form, obviously, of fornication but it's also would fall under adultery, right? Because we're lusting in our heart towards somebody. The word pornography originates from pornea, which is the Webster's cl classical definition of fornication, is voluntary sexual intercourse between, listen, an unmarried man or woman, especially a man. Um, that's definition, but it's a man or a woman. First Corinthians 5 and 1 tells us, about a man who had been married. Let's read there, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, it is commonly reported that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that, that one should have his father's wife. So this is such a sin, it's such a grievous sin, and it's happening in the house of God that it's not even doesn't even happen among Gentiles or just unbelievers or pagans. Uh, he says, but but you've you're claiming to be a Christian and you've you've taken your father's wife. Your father obviously your father married a younger woman, and the son of that of that father um, decided to go ahead and take that uh, woman um, and have a relationship with her. Okay. Um, many times during pagan feasts and temp, temp, the temple prostitutes or harlots uh, were provided for the worshipers. Even today in modern India, though it is illegal, this evil is still done. Even more alarming are children as young as six or seven being sold to these temples. Of course, venereal diseases and now HIV is a huge problem. As these sexually transmitted diseases were in the ancient times, by participating in these vile ceremonies, according to statistics of, of these current temple servants, numbering around 20,000 in just one city of India, the number of HIV infections is, is a staggering 14,000. Viewing pornography can also be classified as a form of spiritual fornication to be discussed later in more detail as idolatry. Most expositors hold to the simple definition as illicit sexual relations between a single unmarried person or persons voluntarily or with consent. It is clear that sexual intercourse outside of a lawful marriage is a work of the flesh and is sinful. No one who professes to know Jesus Christ commit and commits sinful acts can be saved. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. You cannot be saved and stay saved if you are committing these kind of acts. Amen. If someone occupying the pulpit makes light of these mandates, the Bible is clear regarding this type of behavior. It says, number one, that those kind of preachers are Balaam and Jezebel, whether they're a male or a female. Mm -hmm. But also it says, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It says, mm -hmm. goes on and says, Paul says, be not deceived to the Corinthians. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, that's homosexuals, mm -hmm. nor thieves, nor covetous, that means lustful people, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's found in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 19. Why does Paul say this? 
because today you have all kinds of deceivers that are out here trying to say that they're Christians and they're saved. There are no more Christians uh, than, than uh, uh, you know, uh, Kermit the Frog, okay? They are not Christians. Yes. I, I like the next verse, though. The, the, the next verse I love, because all of these sins, you know, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in this list. But verse 11 says, and such were some of you. In other words, if, if you've committed these oh. sins and, and that he's talking to the church, you used to be this way, right? Sure. You used to commit these sins, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified. So God brings this change from being born again and believing the gospel and, and turning from your sins. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I thank God that 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 He shows us these things are wrong, and the remedy is through Christ, where we can, you know, uh, turn from these sins and be justified and sanctified. Right. Exactly. All right. Good. Excellent. Fornication relative to adultery and and divorce. The Bible makes allowance for only one cause for a divorce and that is fornication but i say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causeth her causeth her to commit adultery if you cause her to commit adultery that's a stumbling block and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery okay Some misinterpret fornication as a permission to remarry due to the unfaithfulness of a spouse. It is fornication for someone who is single, not, not having a living spouse, to be married to someone who is divorced with a living companion, even though they may be considered legally married. This is why Paul warned the Corinthians to make sure when considering marriage that they married someone who did not have a living companion, or had never been married. Nevertheless, 1 Corinthians 7 and 2, to avoid fornication, in other words, you're getting yourself into a fornication, let every man have his own wife and every woman have her own husband. 1 Corinthians 7 and 2. Why? It could be possible to marry someone else's spouse, right? So today in our society, 70% um, of people who get married divorce and remarry. And so it's possible to have, and it could be just within six months' time. Brady Spears was married like, I think, less than 30 days, um, maybe not even a week. Okay. And then, and then she ended up married again. So even though, even though um, they may have only been married a week or a month or a year or whatever, um, they are bound to that individual for the rest of their lives if they were uh, legally eligible. Okay. And here Paul tells us to avoid fornication. In other words, uh, God, if if you bring a married person and you take a single person, God can't join them together because they have a living companion. They are an adulterer or an adulteress, and you would be then a fornicator because you're single if you don't if you do, if you don't have a companion. And that's what Paul here is saying, and what Jesus is saying, except to be for the cause of fornication. So if you were to find out uh, that. Um, that individual as a living companion, then you could put them away and marry somebody who has never been married before and or is a widower, which means that their spouse has passed away. Uh, someone may feel that if they are divorced and involved in a relationship with someone who is single, does not have a living spouse, the relationship can be made legitimate by marriage. A legal ceremony in this situation does not change the status of a single individual. God does not divinely sanction a legal ceremony in which one of the married partners, marriage partners has a living spouse. It takes two elements to have a holy matrimony, male and female. Some sexual marriage is also rec not recognized by God and is an assault on the divine institution of marriage. For instance, the, this this new definition of man with man or woman with woman is not marriage, okay? Um, or whatever else they choose, you know, to go down. 
the road with, whether it's a car or a house or whatever, okay? There are all kinds of freaky stuff that's going on. Number one, legal or lawful ceremony. And number two, divine sanction making two one flesh. In the eyes of God, the relationship mentioned above is a legal ceremony without divine sanction. A person with a living companion who engages in another intimate relationship or marriage with someone other than their spouse in the sight of God is an adulterer. The person uh, who is single in the sight of God is always the fornicator. Fornication is a form of adultery that always refers to a single person who does not have a husband or a wife in the sight of God. One who, uh, no one who's married, I'm sorry, no one whose marriage is God ordained can be a fornicator. Remember, they would commit adultery. Mm -hmm. As mentioned earlier, many misinterpret fornication as permission to remarry due to unfaithfulness of a spouse. People married in the sight of God cannot commit fornication. Fornication is always related to the state of being free to marry in the sight of God. Many religious organizations use fornication, um, ex ex the ex fornication exception to mean unfaithfulness mm -hmm. by one party and the other in a lawful marriage bond. This cannot be since God's word has already declared to one flesh, mm -hmm. a sacred relationship, which may, which Man cannot put asunder in the sight of God. Two lawfully married persons, male and female, will be one flesh as long as they both shall live. Divorce or the plea of unfaithfulness cannot dissolve that which God hath joined together, even though one be a harlot or presumably a whoremonger. A whoremonger is a man who goes after many women or harlots. What know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he, it shall be one flesh, as 1 Corinthians 6.16 6, says. Hypothetical case. One partner in a lawful marriage becomes dissatisfied with a relationship, even for, lot, for a logically good reason. If a simple act of fornication, unfaithfulness, okay, if we were using fornication as a de definition for adultery, right, unfaithfulness were biblically legitimate cause for divorce, then that unhappy partner could deliberately commit an act of unfaithfulness with another person outside the marriage union, provoking the other to file divorce or creating his own cause or an, uh, un, uh, I'm sorry, or an unhappy married couple might agree together for one or the, both to commit the act of unfaithfulness in order to get a divorce. It is immediately evident that God would be no partner in such conniving and that he would not have meant the exception clause to be a flimsy loophole. In other words, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and otherwise, it is a strict commandment. When a person who is single in the sight of God legally marries a person who is divorced with a living companion, God places the emphasis on the single person. They are living in the state. Remember, state. They're not, they don't even have to be doing anything. They're living in the state of fornication. There is no divinely sanctioned relationship in his sight. God recognizes the authority of civil law to make the relationship legal. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Matthew 5.32. Jesus revealed the will of the Father and reestablished what was intended from the beginning during his ministry. He decreed that a person who is single in the sight of God has the right to set aside a legal relationship with a person who has a living companion. Jesus placed the emphasis on the single person's right to legally undo the situation. Although the couple were legally married, God did not make them one flesh. Man joined them together legally and man is free to put asunder legally this relationship. The single person is legally and spiritually free to be married to someone who has never been married in the sight of God. For this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man, no man, 
put asunder. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. Um, in a marriage where neither person has a living companion, man cannot dissolve a one flesh relationship. God has bound them together until death. If they break their marriage vows, they are adulterers, not fornicators. In a marriage where one person has a prior living companion and the other is single, no prior living spouse, there is no divinely sanctioned marriage in the sight of God. The single person is free to have a civil law legally dissolve the relationship which God did not sanction. In this case, it is not putting asunder what God has joined. Man is putting asunder what man made legal. We are taught by the word of God to obey every ordinance of man, which not does not directly conflict with the word of God. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king or supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent from him for the, the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that you with well-doing may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, First Peter 2, 13 through 15. Any action which is done legally must be also, must also be undone legally whether God approves or disapproves of the action. A legal marital ceremony is not necessarily a holy marriage in the sight of God. Fornication always refers to a single person indicating that the person is in a marriage where God has not sanctioned a marital covenant, although they are in a legal relationship. The legal ceremony does not make them, uh, this legal ceremony does does not make the single person any less single in God's sight, although he or she is legally married to a divorced person with a living spouse. The single person does not have a husband or a wife in the sight of God. If a person who is single wants to have an intimate relationship, the scripture instructs them to get their own husband or wife. Intimate relationships are only acceptable to God when they are with a person's own husband or wife. Fornication is an intimate relationship or marriage in which the single person does not have a husband or wife of his or her own. They are married to someone else who has a living companion. Fornication indicates the absence of God, a God-ordained marriage covenant. Again, 1 Corinthians 7 and 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Again, fornication is the manifestation of uncleanness of the flesh. It defiles the body by subjecting it to an unholy, intimate legal relationship not sanctified by God. The body is supposed to be wholly prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. The body must die to the works of the flesh to live by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19 says, Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth, is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, but ye are bought with a price. Wherefore I glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Additional scriptures for fornication are found in Second Chronicles 21.11, Ezekiel 16.15, 20 through 29, Acts chapter 15, 20 and 29, 1 Corinthians 5 and 1, 6, 18, 2 Corinthians 12 and 21, and Jude 7. Um, now, with that, if you've never been saved or accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I uh, would, would, would like to let you know that it's really easy. Number one, you have to accept uh, God's forgiveness and uh you have to repent of your sins and turn from what you know is wrong. Um, and the way you do that is through just simply bowing your heart and your head before the Lord and asking him to forgive you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you have to turn away from what you know is wrong and begin to uh, believe and trust the word of God as, uh, uh, as the truth of, for, you, for your soul and for your uh, spirit and begin to read it and study it. And uh, number three is, uh, is begin to follow Jesus every day. And so with that, if you'd like to bow your head and your heart, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And then if there's any questions, we'll go ahead and answer those at this time. Father, we thank you for the great privilege that it is to be able to come before you. 
We ask you, Lord, if we've been hit by the word of God today, if it's struck us, if it's confronted us for our sin, we just ask you to forgive us of our sin. We ask you, Jesus, to come into our heart and change our lives. Lord, help us give us strength to turn away from whatever sin it is. And Lord, we pray that you, in, in turning, that you would just give us strength by your son, that Jesus would come in our heart, change our lives, and help us not to live in sin in any measure, and to give you glory and honor for all that you do in our lives. And we pray now that you would wash us in the blood. And Father, we just pray that you would just uh, help us and give us strength through Jesus. And we ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said,